off the tracks were carrying crude oil, and they Dozens are still of people burning. Have been forced from their homes. This after a train derailed in northwestern Lac Mégantic, Quebec, Plaster Rock, New Brunswick, and London, Ontario, all share something in common: freight trains carrying dangerous materials such as crude oil through their cities. The municipality of Lac Mégantic was rocked when a train carrying crude oil derailed and exploded, killing 47 people. The tragedy fueled the fire for a hailstorm of questions. How could this have been prevented? Why did this happen? And what needs to be changed? These are the questions Canadian municipalities want answered. Lac Megantique's explosion reportedly reached a kilometer in radius. Fanshawe College professor of urban planning and GIS William Pohl explains how close densely populated areas in London are in proximity to railway lines. So within the urban area for the city of London, that's the built up area, uh, residential, commercial, industrial uses, not including things like farmland, about 15 to 20 percent of all of the urban area is within a thousand meters of a railway line and in terms of population yes that that's between 70 to 75 thousand uh, people would be living within a kilometer of a railway now that is around 25 percent of london's population if there ever was a derailment similar to that of the scale of lac megantique carrying dangerous explosive materials, it has the potential to impact anyone within a thousand meters of the railway line. However, many buildings are located closer than a thousand meters of a railway track. In fact, one track runs right through the heart of Richmond Row, quite often wreaking havoc for drivers on their way home are generally two main lines that run through the City of London. One comes uh, from the east, uh, from the Woodstock area, through the east and industrial area, to the railway yards um, in the Egerton Rectory area of the City of London. So that's one railway area. And a second railway comes from the north, uh, from the St. Mary's area, through just by the airport through the industrial area at the east end of Oxford Street, comes through into the city and goes to the uh, railway yards between Adelaide Street and Quebec Street, um, north of uh, Dundas Street. So there's two large railway shunting yards in the city of London, both within the urban area. And going right through the city center? Correct, so they go right through the uh, s center of the city, uh, just north, um, just south of York Street and north of Horton Street, and they continue out west towards Strathroy and Sarnia. Now, what else can you add about uh, railways and in terms of planning and how that's like factored in when you're planning? Yeah. So in the existing urban area of the City of London, where there's already existing residential uh, uses, the city will allow new development or redevelopment of those sites provided they uh, don't create any greater safety risk or improve the safety of the future development. And that may be uh, <coughs> walls or berms again to protect for safety. Um, in the newly developing areas where there's enough space on greenfield sites, they would work with the developer and the, and the railway companies to ensure that there's enough distance setback, as well as again the berms to ensure the safety. So there's a there's a bit of a difference between existing and greenfield sites. Now for the berms, um, is that factored in like, is that for noise pollution or is that for in case uh, a train were to derail? Um, when the city looks at application, there's really three aspects that they look at. First of all, the safety, so derailments, accidents happening. Secondly, for noise, because railways create a lot of noise. And thirdly, the vibration. And every time an application comes forward, you look at all of those three specific issues. So the berm 
has benefits from safety perspective. Uh, rail, rail cars can't go over the berm. Berms provide a noise attenuation. They, they hold back the noise from the railway as well as the vibration. So the berm has uh, three positive things to allow the railways to go through and allow residential development. Now, is there potential for these bylaws to maybe change, uh, considering what has happened in Lac Megantique? Like, is can that change the precedent of what they used to base those three uh, things on, like the safety and the? Um, I, I think um, whatever comes out of the Lac, Lac Megantique uh, review of the issues there, it may influence the future of land use planning. Um, so there's there's potential for that. I think it's the outcomes will likely be more focused on the operations and the uh, safety measures of how the railways come through the municipality. Um, land use planning has grown up around railways. Railways were an important part of the development of the City of London, many cities across southern Ontario, and while we want to make sure they're safe, we also see them as a really positive uh, contributor to transportation, moving people from city to city. And we, as planners, want to make sure that we don't lose that opportunity for a passenger, as well as maintaining that freight movement. So there may be changes, but I think they'll be more operational. When it comes to where you can build near railway tracks, the bylaws might surprise you. The City of London has zoning regulations that say if you have new residential development, it has to be at least 120 meters from the edge of the railway to the nearest house. And that's enough space uh, to provide some safety measures for the housing. If you uh, put a berm, so that's an earthen berm, two and a half meters high, between the railway and the house, the house can be 30 meters from the edge of the railway to the back of the house. So how well is London prepared for an emergency like that seen in Lac Megantique? Division Manager for Corporate Security and Emergency Management for the City of London, Dave O'Brien, sat down to discuss the safety precautions in place in case of railway accidents. Okay, now Dave, what can you tell me about um, the emergency response plan in the event of something similar to Lac Megantique? So we have uh, several different emergency response plans that exist that would potentially come into play uh, related to an incident of that nature. Uh, the first is the overall London emergency response plan, which is the overriding plan we use to manage any large-scale emergency in our community. And that plan defines the roles and responsibilities of approximately 15 different agencies that would come together uh, under the management uh, uh, and leadership of, of the senior members of those agencies across our city. And uh, each would take those responsibilities and manage them collectively. Uh, it could include a variety of things, but evacuation, response to a fire, those types of things. In, in addition to that, we have a hazardous materials emergency response plan that relates to any specific incident where there is a density or an issue related to uh, a potentially dangerous chemical. And that particular plan uh, involves, again, additional roles and responsibilities of, of primary agencies such as the fire department and police department and environmental services and their roles in related to those specific types of incidents. So those two plans are the main plans that would come into play should an event like that happen within our community. Now, say um, uh, prior to the FCM's recommendations to the Declaration of Hazardous Materials being transported, mm -hmm. making it um, a compulsory, not voluntary, uh, was London privy to that information? And would the Hazardous Materials team be able to uh, like, have res responded appropriately, I guess is my question, prior to these changes? Right. So in London... Uh, and I, I don't know what happens sort of across Ontario, but we have, given that we have two primary rails running through our community, uh, had a long-standing relationship with the rail uh, community and have for years 
been involved in many, many different training exercises uh, in relation to events that could occur within our community. So we've had a, a long-standing not only relationship related to the products that run through our community and uh, getting that knowledge uh, from them, but also working together as a response mechanism should anything happen within our community. Uh, to the point that two years ago, we ran a full-scale exercise uh, as part of our emergency management mandate uh, in relation to a train derailment with a chemical uh, spill associated to it. Um, and annually, uh, we've had training events with the rail and, in fact, are in the process of actually scheduling a five-day training event for this year with both uh, the main rails that run through the city. So we've had that knowledge uh, for a significant period of time, many years, uh, and, in fact, have been doing training and exercises with them uh, for, for many years as well. So what kind of exercises do these involve uh, when you're doing a mock training? So what we would do is there's two types, uh, and sometimes they're combined, like we did two years ago, where we actually had... Uh, simulated an event in the community without actually obviously doing any kind of release, but we would go to a rail yard and identify, a, you know, as an example, a tanker and simulate that it had had been in an accident and that it was leaking and, and actually have our responders on site doing the appropriate responses based on what they would anticipate would happen right in a, in a real live sort of event. Uh, and we would also do a table talk exercise, which is, you know, sort of role-playing the various outcomes that might occur as a result of that event. And sometimes we do that both at the same time. So we have our team actually, you know, in a rail yard with a tanker where they actually have to get out there and put the plugs in and, and deal with the cars as they would normally. And they're, of course, working with our, our team back in our emergency operations center and making those appropriate decisions around evacuation and housing evacuees and all those types of things that come with large-scale events. We will be right back with Division Manager for Corporate Security and Emergency Management for the City of London, Dave O'Brien, after this on 106.9 The Axe.